For Criminal Media's Policy, I'm Tabi Madiba, Director of Investigations at Shadow World Investigations, and author Paul Holden joins me to unpack his book titled Zondo at Your Fingertips. Hi, Paul. Hi, thanks for having me. So your book summarizes and condenses the Zondo Commission's final reports, its findings, and its conclusions. So is this meant to be a guide to the Commission? That's the idea. When the Commission came out, the final reports were just incredibly long. You know, it's four and a half thousand, five thousand pages of very dense material, um, which is very legalistic and some of it's quite forensic and it's quite detailed discussions in there that I think were quite alienating to the average reader. So the idea behind the book was to take all of that incredible material, because I do think the Zonda Commission was an amazing commission in terms of what I'd uncovered, and condense it, make it much shorter, um, but also write it in language that people can understand, everyday people can understand, unpack the complex legal stuff into more simple phrases um, so that every person in South Africa can read it and enjoy it and hopefully read it and enjoy it for a long time. And you presented over 15,000 pages of evidence and reports to the mm -hmm. Commission attempting to help the Commission trace the money stolen by the Gupta family. So can you tell us more about your engagements with the Commission? Sure. I mean, so our, our engagement with the Commission started in about 2019. Um, what had happened was that my organization was given a copy of the Gupta leaks, um, plus uh, transaction records from HSBC. And we processed the Gupta leaks using different sort of forensic software. And we came up with all this new evidence that people didn't know about in relation to Astina, uh, but also Translate as well. So I made two submissions to the Commission. And on that basis, the Commission asked me to come and give evidence for two days, just on Astina and Transnet which I then did. And then thereafter, the commission said to me, um, I was working with the, what they called their flow funds teams, so trying to track all the money, that they'd done a huge amount of investigations into the money around state capture, how much had been stolen, how it had been paid in bribes, whether the money was laundered. Um, but they needed somebody to sort of take all that material and sort of knock it into shape and also to help them probe further angles to try and generate some sort of sense of what was going on. Um, so then I worked with the commission for six months and in that process, we, we, we did a huge amount of investigations trying to follow all the money. Uh, and we, uh, I eventually generated a report which looked at three different things. One was the amount uh, that was paid out by the state in contracts that were tainted by state capture with the Guptas. The second was, was calculating um, the total amount of kickbacks paid to the Guptas. So in the first instance, we, we calculated 57 billion rand in contracts were affected by state capture. And in the second instance, there was 16 billion rand paid in kickbacks. And then the third thing we did was look at the money laundering networks that the Guptas had used to move some of the money abroad. And then I gave evidence on that for about four days based on that, that report. And can you tell us more about how the capture of SARS was economic and politically despoliation of the highest order? Sure. I, mean, I, I think that um, the capture of SARS of all the different things that the Commission looked at, is one that I find the most upsetting. And I think it was the one that was potentially the most damaging. And the reason I say that is because SARS is at the literally the heart of the state. I and mean, you, you cannot have a modern functioning country and state if you don't have a tax revenue service that's collecting tax from people who need to pay it and making sure that the state has the money to deliver services to people. And the capture of SARS and the destruction of the capacity of SARS to do its job, which is really what was at the heart of this, this process of capture. In particular, the destruction of the capacity of SARS to tackle the illicit economy, so smuggling, customs violations, tobacco smuggling, gold smuggling, that sort of thing, was absolutely destroyed. And in that, I think it was just the most egregious um, attack on the most fundamental parts of our state. Mm -hmm. And briefly talk to us more on how contracts worth more than 40 billion rand were irregularly awarded to the companies linked to the Gupta enterprise. Yeah, I mean, basically what happens is that the commission is very clear that South Africa, that the state was captured. Um, and the, the commission clarifies what they mean by that. They, what they mean by state capture is a specific project by which political actors and actors outside of the state, in particular the Guptas, work together to take over all aspects of the state that uh, dealt with procurement. So that meant taking over those aspects of the state that developed policies that led to you know, decisions to buy stuff. Then it was packing the boards of SEOs with, um, 
with Gupta acolytes. And then it was making sure the procurement officers followed their line. And then it was also about making sure that law enforcement was captured so that if these, these allegations came to light, nobody would be prosecuted. And it's through that process of extensive state capture, and, and really it affected pretty much every single SEO in the country, um, the Guptas were able to you know, take huge amounts of money out of the country. I mean, 16 billion rand kickbacks is about a billion dollars, and it's really substantial. And tell us more on how corruption and fraud at Busasa Group of Companies extended its tentacles through to the political system, reaching all the way to former President Jacob Zuma. I mean, the Basasa chapter is, is, is probably one of the biggest single investigations the commission did. So of the 4,500, 5,000 pages the commission wrote, 1,000 were on Basasa. It was one of their most interesting and in-depth investigations. And what they established at Basasa was that the people that ran Basasa were incredibly well connected politically and used those political connections with you know, the police commissioner at the time um, to ensure they got contracts. But they also seemed to have direct connections to Jacob Zuma. Um, and there were quite a lot of evidence that things like Jacob Zuma's birthday party, his the celebration and, and the, the various drinks and the entertainment were paid for by Basasa. And Basasa made it very clear that they were paying for it. I mean, one of the good examples, one of the most vivid examples, is that one of Jacob Zuma's birthday parties, there was a huge cake for him to cut mm. and it had the Basasa logo on it. <laughs> um, so, you know, they were very, you know, the guy who ran Basasa, guy called Gavin Watson, was very, very, very closely linked to the ANC from the struggle, struggle era because his family was a struggle family. Um, and then they used those connections all the way through to the present. And the Free State uh, Provincial Government was the primary site of state capture that acted as the pool of talent of biggest highest in the province. So can you tell us about the Estina scandal delivered on a plate by provincial officials, which served as the Gupta's first serious money state capture? Mm. So the Free State is, is where they first practiced state capture and where they first sort of got their, their big breaks. Um, and it was after they succeeded with the free state that they then moved on to bigger targets. Mm -hmm. So even though in, in total terms, the amount of money they got out of the free state, I identified the three biggest places they got money from, the Guptas, from the state, was Transnet, ESCOM, and the free state. But the free state's very small compared to Transnet and ESCOM. But the important point about it is that the free state was where they perfected their technique and they effectively generated and created a cadre of, of officials who then would appear again and again and again in Free State Capture. So one of them was Masa Benzizwani, for example, who was at the Free State at the time of Estina and then moved on to become Department of Mineral Resources, um, the minister there intervening on behalf of the Guptas. I mean, what happened with Estina is, you know, it's a pretty outrageous story. There was a, a policy that was developed that um, the Free State government would invest in a, a dairy farm um, the idea being, what was told to the public, is that they would buy cows and they would buy dairy processing material, like stuff to pasteurize milk and produce cheese and whatever, and that would be for the benefit of the community and the community would get stakes in the project. But it was a total lie, because actually Estina was entirely controlled by the Guptas. I mean, literally the company Estina had been formed years before and the Guptas were already using it for money laundering. Um, and then my evidence before the commission was to explore the way in which the 250 million rand that was paid in by the Free State Government into Estina, how much of it actually went to the Guptas, to Gupta companies, and it was the vast majority of, of the Estina money. And talk to us more on how the commission sought to investigate how state capture was allowed to happen, and in particular what Sola Ramaphosa, the ANC and Parliament did mm. to halt the extraordinary corruption of the Zuma era. Yeah, I mean, one thing the commission, uh, I think one of the very good things about the commission is, it, is it, it didn't just look at and identify what corruption had happened. So, you know, went through all the SOEs, it looked at Transit, looked at ESCOM, looked at SAA, Alex Corr, <laughs> Bizarre Surprise, all that sort of stuff, and, and identified what corruption had happened. But then it also applied its mind to trying to understand what had allowed the corruption to happen and what could be done to stop the corruption in the future. And it made a whole series of recommendations and observations, but one of the key ones was that the ANC was was deeply, profoundly implicated in state capture, um, and that it was ANC processes and structures that facilitated and created the space for state capture. So he's, um, Zondo is incredibly critical of the ANC and incredibly critical of Sir Ramaphosa for not stopping state capture because 
in a very compelling section of the report, they set out how everybody knew about state capture from about 2012 onwards, right? Like people knew that what was going on and really nobody stopped it. Even worse, the ANC were implicated in facilitating it. So the good example, you know, the one of the examples that he, he spent a lot of time looking at is what they call the, the deployment committee within the ANC, which is effectively was run by the deputy president at the time. So between 2014 and 2018, it was um, Sora Ramaphosa who was running it. Um, and that committee decided who was going to be appointed to the boards of SEOs, who was going to be appointed as a judge, apparently, um, you know, all sorts of senior appointments in the state. So all the people who facilitated state capture at those institutions were appointed by the ANC Deployment Committee first before they were approved for appointment to the board. Um, and the commission is damning of that. So, you know, people like Brian Malefi, who should never have been anywhere near, uh, anywhere near the sort of pot of money, was appointed there by the, mm -hmm. the ANC. He was deployed there by the ANC. And, and as a result, those people are implicated and they're responsible for it. And lastly, Paul, you criticized the Zonda Commission report. Mm -hmm. So what are the shortcomings you take issue with? Sure. So first of all, I should say that uh, I don't just criticize the Zonda Commission. I have a, a section before that where I say all the good things about mm -hmm. the commission too. And I do think the commission was was incredible. Um, having now lived in the UK for quite a long time and, and traveled around the world, the Zonda Commission is, is globally unique. There's nowhere else in the entire world where you've had a senior judge spent four years investigating the corruption of the sitting government. It just doesn't happen anywhere, right? And the investigation they did was very good. Um, you know, they really went all out to find as much as they could. So the problems I have with it are, are twofold, really. My two primary problems with it is, one, I think that the commission didn't spend enough time explaining and making recommendations about the multinational companies that made money from state capture. So big German companies in particular, like T-Systems and SAP, were, and, and then American companies like McKinsey and Bain, were deeply implicated in state capture. But the commission, what it describes their activities, doesn't actually make any recommendations about them. So it doesn't say South African law enforcement must go and liaise with German law enforcement to tackle T-Systems. Um, so I think the multinational companies sort of get a, a feature, but don't to have the same level of attention paid to them as as South African officials. So that's one thing. The second thing is I think that, you know, in the work that I did for the commission, tracing all the money through the various bank accounts, is that it was very obvious at, at times that these accounts were being used for money laundering, and yet they weren't disrupted by the banks. And I felt like the commission could have been much harder on the South African banking system and the enablers of state capture who allowed this stuff to happen, including auditors, you know, there's one section in, in the Zonda Commission report that looks at the auditors at, at SAA, which is very powerful. But I think it would have been very helpful if the Commission looked at the role of auditors and other SEOs as well and put forward serious reforms about how the banking sector could clean up its act and also how the, the auditing sector could clean up its act as well. Thanks a lot, Paul. That was Paul Holden speaking to Criminal Media's Polity about Zonda at your fingertips.